so as long as i have observed in students two subjects where they really think that they are trying to study but they are not able to make it in the examination so the two important subjects are surgery and og they are saying lot of cases comes they don't know how to think during the examination surgery and og are very bulk subjects so it makes us stressed so it takes long time so i thought like uh, instead of studying surgery just like that i thought of i am thinking of making it a little fun here so first know what kind of question paper you are going to get from surgery surgery means abdomen surgery means git and abdomen surgery means abdomen so the git almost comprises 30% even 40% somewhat around 40% of your questions will fall from this category so if you understand git you can easily cope up with surgery following that important is genito urinary systems so that is kidney then the important is thyroid head and neck right thyroid then the important is breast breast these four topics alone these four topics alone along with if you study burns and trauma almost 80% of your surgery is done if you do this easily 80% surgery will be done so anything they ask you 80% of it will comprise from this i repeat abdomen the git git renal breast thyroid burns and trauma burns and trauma are small topics burns and trauma so if you want to go for a 90% of your question paper you should add up only one thing that is going to be the vascular surgery vascular surgery but that is additional so these are almost 80% of your paper so if you make this very very easy i think in your exam almost 70% of your mcqs will be answered right easily from this 80% so what i'm going to do is i'm going to instead of starting from general surgery i'm going to start up with your git abdomen and git so in this way first i want to cover this 40% and i want to make it easy for you very very easy so that any question from any nook and corner you get a question you should be able to face it first of all you should be able to face it and able to think during the examination what are we going to do we are going to see git like a story so we will go to the contents later first what are we going to do is you are eating food say so eating you are consuming food the food enters the esophagus the food enters the esophagus from esophagus the food enters the stomach from stomach it goes to the intestines small intestines and then you have colon ascending colon a transverse colon and a descending colon and finally food goes in the anus and finally it comes out of the body so imagine this entire process is happening in a tube so first you need to get the concepts of this tube the entire small tube the lengthy tube so the entire lengthy tube if you get to know what it is you will know what to do in your examination so let's say you have a drainage tube at home so a tube that is running behind so the first thing is what and all can happen in the drainage tube so the must the hairs the must can block the drainage tube so the drainage tube can get blocked right so that is the first possibility number 2 is something can grow imagine this is a lively drainage tube so something can grow and obstruct it it is called obstruction that is number 2 number 3 is 
the drainage tube can get damaged somewhere. So we can call it perforation, ulcer, whatever. That is number three. The possibility number three. Number four is the drainage tube is not complete. It is blunt somewhere. That is number four. That is number four. Okay. Number five possibility is, imagine this drainage tube. Imagine this drainage tube is kind of elastic. So when there is a lot of, from the drainage materials, when there is a lot of gas, this drainage tube can be expanded. So that is number five problem. Right? The drainage tube can be expanded. That's number five problem. Number six is something. So here, so something can, something can grow inside. Something can grow inside from inside. It can grow outside also. Something can grow outside. That is number six problem. So these are the basic problems you can feel with the lively drainage tube. This is how I want you to think. So imagine the entire GIT like this tube. Now, what are you going to do to clear this blockage in this tube? If this tube is in your home, what are you going to do? If some must is getting accumulated, what will you try to do? So you will try to push the so you will apply something called Dranex. That is a powder. What this will do is this will break this into smaller pieces. So it will be flushed out. Right. That is what you're going to do. So if there is a, some, if there is some growth, which is blocking the drainage, what are you going to do? You're going to find out where it is the growth. Where, where is the growth so that you cannot directly see. So you're going to send a camera inside and you're going to see that. So if you see, this blockage with a camera you are going to send an instrument along with the camera you will pick this and bring it out now you don't know if this growth will again happen or not so you will cut a piece from it and you will check what is that so that is called biopsy you'll cut a piece and you will see what is that that is called biopsy then if there is a damage in the tube so the contents are leaking somewhere. So if the contents are leaking, let's say that leakage happens inside your home. This tube is a superficial tube. So this leakage inside happens inside your home. What will happen when you step, you will get infected. This is a drainage. So what you will try to do is you will open everywhere. You will find out where is the leakage. You cannot directly find out the leakage. So you will pass some water inside and you will see the contents getting leaked out like a puncture that is happening in the uh, cycle wheels. So what they do, they fill the wheel with air. They will press it inside the uh, water tub. Then they will see the leakage very clearly. So that leakage either they will, either they will close the drainage, sorry. So either they will plaster it So either they will plaster it or what they do, if they, if they think it's very tough to plaster that area, they will cut that area. So in front and back, they will cut the area and they will unite the previous two areas, the front area and the back area, they will unite. That is what you're going to do. So either you're going to patch it, either you're going to patch it or what you're going to do is you're going to excise the part excise the part. So only that punctured area you cannot excise. So some area you will leave in front, some area you will, some area will take out in front, some area will take out in the back. That is wide local excision, wide local excision. So widely locally you will take it out. And then if the tube is filled with air, a lot of air. So if this air is blocking further uh, contents to get out, what you will do? So you will make a small hole here and you will let the air come out. You will make a small hole here. You will let the air come out. 
so before trying to do that what you will try to do is you will try to press this and see if this is able to fix or not so you will try to fix it automatically so you are not you cannot press with your hands so what you will do you will put something inside you will give some medication you will put something inside that will go here and this something is going to shrink this tube so when the tube is shrinked the air is going to due to pressure it is going to come out of the tube am i clear till now are you all getting the concepts so i'm trying to uh, teach with a drainage tube so that whatever happens in the drainage tube it is going to happen within us okay then the next is a growth that can grow inside and it can come out and it can spread outside that grow so now we'll go quick so as i said so this is a tube let's consider this is a tube there's a chance the what are all the chances either there is some small blockage in which you will have to clear the blockage there can be small growth that is limited to a place in which what you do is you send a tube and then you find that uh, block and then you take it out you cut a piece of it and then you see what it is so you see will it spread or not and then the next possibility is um, if it is a cancerous growth inside so if it's a cancerous growth inside that is what number 6 i was trying to say last time so if the cancerous growth is inside this tube means this can grow somewhere else also so what you need to do is you need to know you need to know what you are dealing with so you find out what it is and then you find out if any other places affected or not so if any other places affected there also you will have to treat if this place is affected this one also you will have to treat so if it is only localized here very good for you you can cut this and you can rejoin it so but if other areas are also affected only treating here is not going to help you right then there is a chance of any uh, air obstruction could be there so in that case either you will cut a part of it and you will let the air leak out of the tube otherwise you will give something to make sure that this again uh, this air escapes properly so i'll try to do that so uh, and then if there is a uh, what do you call a perforation there is a if there is a hole in the tube you will try to either patch it or you will try to cut the front and back of the tube and then you will uh, you will uh, rejoin them if the tube is blunt what are you going to do you are going to cut the end of the tube so that the tube will be open remained open so to keep it open after this blunt area there is going to be another blunt area after that so you are going to cut the blunt area in that side also you are going to join these two together right this is called as atresia this is called as atresia okay one more possibility in this tube is suddenly the tube can become narrow If the tube becomes narrow like this all the waste materials will be dumped here so you will have to either you will have to either dilate this part or you will have to cut this part and you will have to rejoin them is this simple this is the entire concept what the git surgery will be dealing about if you know these concepts you will know what to answer just whenever you get a question from git imagine this tube so if in the drainage tube that is inside your home whatever you will do if you apply the same you can get the result so we're going to start with git topic so the first topic is going to be congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis i said git is like a tube 
JIT is like a tube. So before going here, before going here, I would like to talk a little bit about the esophagus problems. So hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is a stomach problem. So in esophagus problem, similar uh, types of issues can happen in this esophagus. Whatever I told that is happening in the tube. So either there could be a esophageal. Uh, so esophagus has two sphincters. This is upper and lower sphincter. I just want you to listen. There's no point in making notes for everything. You just have to listen because we already discussed about these points in medicine. So there are two sphincters. There is upper sphincter and the lower sphincter. You can get a problem with these sphincters. So the upper sphincter, as I already said, is voluntary sphincter. The lower sphincter is involuntary contraction. So that is not in your um, control. So the voluntary sphincter is cricopharynx. So this cricopharynx, if they have, if there is an issue in this cricopharynx, you will have to surgically correct this cricopharynx. But if there is an issue in this lower esophageal sphincter, you can try medications first. Why? Because this is voluntary. If you lose the voluntary contraction, you will have to surgically correct it because that's an anatomical problem. So that is the first point I am going to tell you. So what problem you can get in that voluntary contraction is there is something called cricopharyngeal web. We already saw it, cricopharyngeal web, which is going to maximally limit the food intake of the patient. That is going to cause iron deficiency. That is going to cause iron deficiency anemia. Okay, cricopharyngeal web or esophageal web. So whenever there is an esophageal web, surgically correcting it is the correct way of dealing it. Okay, that is the first option. Next, this esophagus can have a block. That block could be a polyp. So if there is a polyp, what you are going to do? You are going to do, you are going to see is it cancerous or not. There are two ways of seeing it. One is look at the number of polyps. If it is only one, almost it is almost it is not cancerous if this polyp is many if there are many polyps it could be cancerous so you're going to cut a piece of it you're going to look for it in a microscope and then you're going to check it if it is cancerous or not uh, if there's a polyp if there's a polyp you're going to see is it cancerous or not if it is cancerous you're going to remove the entire tube If there is a polyp, if it is cancerous, you are going to remove the part of the tube that is important. If it is not cancerous, you can remove the polyp alone. So that is the second point that you need to know. Okay. The third point is if there is a perforation, if there is a hole here. If there is a perforation, there is a hole, you are going to either patch it or you are going to cut it. You are going to cut the above and below portion. Why? Because the contents from the esophagus or the contents from the stomach can get regurgitated and come back and it can go to the heart. Right? So it can go to the heart. So from in esophageal perforation, the gastric contents is going to go surrounding the heart area. If there is a gastric perforation, it is going to, or intestinal perforation, it is going to go to the peritoneum. It is going to go to the abdomen area, peritoneum. So that point you need to know. So whatever it is, so there is a, so whatever it is, there is a perforation. Perforation means either you're going to patch it or you're going to uh, take out that perforated area. And then you're going to rejoin these two parts. Is that clear? Then the next part can be, the next problem can be, the esophagus suddenly becomes like this. That means this part is highly spasmatic. So there's spasm in this part in the lower esophageal sphincter or upper esophageal sphincter, wherever it is, where there's a spasm, you're going to give an injection over here and you're going to try, you will try to relieve that spasm or you can, what you can do is either you can cut this portion, you can cut this portion and join this part of esophagus with your stomach. So those are the two things that you're going to do. Okay. So you will have to study all those. All those actually conditions came already in medicine part. So I'm not going to talk about it for the meantime. So we are going to go for the stomach now. 
the first condition that I would like to say here is congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, which means the part of the stomach that is the pylorus The part of the stomach that is pylorus, the end part of the stomach. So this pylorus, there is a stenosis. So there is a blockage. Along with that, there is a hypertrophy. Means muscles are. So because of this, the food cannot go out. This is called as gastric outlet obstruction. This someone's mic is on please turn it off so this is gastric outlet obstruction so when this happens what happens is whatever food the child eats it gets stored here and it will be repulsed back back and the baby is going to vomit that is called as projectile vomiting now this Part. whenever a child is vomiting or when an adult is vomiting you have to know is it bilious or non bilious vomiting bilious or non bilious vomiting you know after the um, stomach at the part of duodenum this is where the bile comes and flows so if any vomiting which is non bilious which means before the duodenum is the obstruction whatever problem it is it is before the duodenum any vomiting which is non bilious is before the duodenum so it should lay in the stomach it should lay in the stomach is that clear so non bilious means they are trying to tell you that the duodenum is perfectly fine you don't have to worry the duodenum is fine the liver is fine the gallbladder is fine there is no point in evaluating those parts non bilious means before the duodenum before the bile as it falls in a place right so before that place is the problem projectile vomiting projectile vomiting is seen in congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis very important mcq so projectile means the baby will vomit far away from the place where he is standing so that is projectile vomiting projectile vomiting can also be seen in increased intraocular pressure projectile vomiting can also be seen in papilledema papilledema so but here you need to remember congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis if only one question that comes from surgery there is going to be chps you should be very very clear with this topic okay now so this is a growth so hypertrophy this area is a hypertrophy so what are you going to do there is obstruction there is a blockage because of the hypertrophy correct that hypertrophy do a surgery the name of the surgery is called ram study operation so now no food is reaching the uh, intestines so the baby don't get any energy at all and then there is a hypertrophied area since the hypertrophied area is there all the food is getting uh, all the food will get accumulated in the stomach after the baby eats so after the child is fed the abdomen will look big that is like a lump there is a lump felt in the abdomen and a visible peristalsis will be there the stomach will try its best to push the food down so a visible peristalsis non bilious vomiting and a lump in abdomen is felt very very important so when this happens fourth week after birth fourth week after birth okay so what are you going to do you can actually pass a tube and you can check it but it's a four weeks old baby so you'll go for ultrasound you go for ultrasound so the baby will have electrolyte imbalances of course and metabolic alkalosis because the baby keeps on vomiting so continuous vomiting means metabolic alkalosis vomiting or continuous diarrhea where whatever the child has there's going to be metabolic alkalosis so treatment is collect electrolyte imbalance collect the electrolytes imbalance and do a surgery without a the surgery there is no cure for this so surgery is needed ram study operation so chps you need to remember ram study operation so i want you to remember chps the name of the child is ram ram is the name of the child ram is the name of the child so ram study operation am i clear here okay 
so this is a blockage when i talked about perforation i told two things uh, the perforation in the esophagus can go to the hot pericardium the perforation in the intestines can go to um what is that uh, the peritoneum so the in in between is the stomach the upper part of the stomach if there's a perforation you need to know the diaphragm lies at the lower part of the uh, esophagus so uh, below anything below the diaphragmatic level anything below there if there's a perforation that is directly going to move to the abdominal area peritoneum so a part of a mildly a part of the stomach is going to be in the a part of the fundus is going to be in the cardia and a part of fundus is going to be over overlapping that um, diaphragm area so only in those area if there is a perforation there's a chance of the materials to leak out in the pericardial area causing pericarditis okay okay so those are two things that we talked now for pericarditis and this why i told suddenly about that is the next topic we are going to deal with is peptic ulcer so peptic ulcer means you have to remember peptic ulcer means you must remember perforation a young child with peptic ulcer in long term the perforation can happen and perforation can cause peritonitis so peptic ulcer perforation peritonitis 3p you must remember peptic ulcer perforation peritonitis yesterday itself i told peptic ulcer means duodenal and gastric ulcer two types are there duodenal means if the patient takes food the pain will get relieved gastric means pain worsens by food that again is a simple concept if you know the concept it is very easy so here is the stomach here is the duodenum if here is the ulcer if you eat food if there is gastric ulcer you take food when the food touches this ulcer area the pain is going to start but duodenal ulcer means here is the acid the acid if it goes and falls in duodenum there is already ulcer so there is already ulcer so the acid that is falling on the duodenal ulcer area it is going to worsen that area so what you have to deal with this ulcer is provide some food the moment you provide some food the acid will focus on the food to digest so that the acid will not no longer go and touch the duodenum so that when the patient eats food the pain will be relieved so if you get this concept you will know no matter how lengthy the question is they are simply trying to say that there is a problem in the stomach there is a problem in the duodenum so if there is a problem in the stomach food will worsen as if there is a problem in the duodenum food will relieve it am i clear here did you get this concept very good second concept here so let's not go by notes i am not going to go by the exact words by notes i want you to understand the concepts if you don't get the concept there is no point in reading this notes so let's take this enlargement in in between as stomach so let's say if there is any problem in the stomach and the patient is vomiting this is the point i already told there is any problem in this area that is duodenum and the patient is vomiting you have to remember look at the bilious vomiting so bilious vomiting means duodenum is affected non bilious vomiting means stomach is affected i repeat bilious vomiting means even the first two parts of the duodenum is affected bilious vomiting means duodenum is affected non bilious vomiting means stomach is affected okay so there is a ulcer in any case let it be in the stomach or not look at the vomit you can say where is the ulcer okay now if the patient is having gastric ulcer whenever he eats food the pain will be there so he will avoid food this person will not eat food so what will happen this person is going to lose weight duodenal ulcer patient will not lose weight gastric ulcer patient will lose his weight duodenal ulcer will not lose weight because food is relieving the pain so he will eat lot of food so these people duodenal ulcer can get fat these people can get thin gastric ulcer people can get thin 
Now, this person is continuously avoiding the food. Those who are having gastric ulcer is continuously avoiding the food. So this is going to cause a lot of acid secretions. A lot of acid secretion in the stomach. This can raise the risk of gastric cancer in the future. Whereas duodenal ulcer is fine. So he eats food, he's comfortable. So he's eating normally. So that's not a problem. So duodenal ulcer is not going to become as a cancer mostly. But gastric ulcer is going to turn out to be a cancer. So there is no need to memorize this table. It's all just plain understanding. Okay. So then whatever it is, let it be duodenal problem. Let it be gastric problem. You can maybe you can just by seeing the patient you can diagnose. But still for proving it to the patient, all you're going to do is send a tube inside. I said, wherever there's a problem, send a tube inside. Look for the problem. Is it in the gastric area? Is it in the duodenal area? So the tube that you're going to send here must reach until duodenum. So that tube is going to be upper GI endoscopy. That is going to be upper GI endoscopy. Upper GI, upper GI endoscopy. Good. Okay. So the treatment is going to be for peptic ulcer. You are going to find out if there is acid. You are going to treat that. If there is H pylori, I told H pylori is the major cause. You are going to treat the H pylori with triple therapy. So those are not surgical points for you. They have to know, are you able to find out is it duodenal ulcer or gastric ulcer? And are you able to say that you are going to send a tube inside or not? That's it. There ends their discussion. This is what they are expecting from you in examination. The next is surgery for peptic ulcer. Now, this is a uh, lot of students have asked me that they are not able to remember this point so answer is very simple if you just read the uh, question uh, read the point very well you can understand it highly selective vagotomy vagotomy plus entrectomy bilroad type 1 that is gastro duodenal type 2 is gastro jejunal then exploratory laparotomy with peritoneal lavage these are the key words that you are dealing with here so let's say Highly selective vagotomy. Who needs this? So you have tried a lot of things, but it did not work out well. You have tried a lot of things, but it did not work out well. So what you do is you go for a highly selective procedure where you find out a problem in an area in the duodenum, where you find a problem in the area in a duodenum. Whereas the stomach is fine because for treating the stomach, you have a lot of medications. The stomach is fine. So you have to treat specifically the duodenum. So you tried medications for a long time. It did not work because all the medications work still this level, stomach level. So for long standing duodenal ulcer, when it does not involve the antrum of the stomach, that is the time you are going for highly selective vagotomy. Okay. 